you weren't like a trained cage fighter going into the UFC. <laughs> yeah. Still not, but <laughs> <laughs> you're not tapping guys out on your, your no, free no. time. One of my favorite aspects of this show is getting these little peeks behind the high performance curtain. Even if we don't work in elite sport or have the resources they have available to them, getting an understanding into the systems and thought processes they use to build the best athletes in the world can still be invaluable. Plus, if I get to talk to a former IFAST intern who is absolutely crushing it in life, well, that's never a bad thing either. Which is why I'm absolutely thrilled to have my guy, Aaron Kunanen, back on the Physical Preparation Podcast. Aaron is entering his second season as the Director of Applied Sports Science for the Cincinnati Reds. He has previous stints as Sports Science Coordinator for the San Francisco Giants and Performance Support Manager for the UFC Performance Institute. Aaron began his career in sport performance coaching, the sport of weightlifting, at the USA Weightlifting Center for High Performance and Development, which led to an assistant coach and lead sports scientist role at the Olympic training site for weightlifting at East Tennessee State University, where he also completed his PhD. Aaron's research background includes athlete monitoring, periodization, and weightlifting biomechanics. Now, if you're a regular to the show, welcome back. As always, love and appreciate you. And if you're new here, welcome. I'm Mike Robertson, and this is the Physical Preparation Podcast. In this show, we take deep dives into the art and science of coaching, cueing, program design, business, and personal development. Basically, anything to help you become a better trainer, coach, or rehab professional. Now, as someone that's worked with pro athletes primarily in the off-season, I'm always intrigued how team-based practitioners like Aaron undulate their approach across the calendar year. Furthermore, While I like talking about the hard science, KPIs, and things you should be tracking and measuring, I really wanted to hear about his emphasis on the people side of sports science. For example, a lot of programs might talk about being athlete-centric, but are they really doing that in practice? And if not, how can we get better? How can we track and measure data that's truly impactful to the coaches and athletes who need it most? Now, of course, it wouldn't be a sports science show, without talking a little bit about KPIs. But we try to dive deeper and figure out how to apply those KPIs to the individual, not only to get someone ready for elite sport, but to also help keep them ready for the rigors that occur over a 162-game professional baseball season. And last but not least, with Aaron having been new to both the mixed martial arts and pro baseball spaces when he started there, we talk about how you could start in a new space and actually use that lack of experience to your advantage. There's some fantastic back and forth in this episode, and I really hope you're going to enjoy it. So we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with this awesome new episode with Aaron Kunana. Did you know that in any given year, 40% of the trainers and coaches in our industry will leave our industry? Maybe that's why it seems like almost every day I talk to trainers and coaches who are frustrated. Maybe they're frustrated with the results they're getting. Maybe they're frustrated because they don't have trusted resources to learn from. And maybe they're frustrated because they simply don't have enough clients and wonder how long they'll be able to stay in the industry. So if this sounds anything like you, let me tell you how I can help. My Complete Coach Certification was created for trainers and coaches just like you people who are serious about the results they get and know that becoming a better coach can directly translate to a bigger bottom line. This certification is going to take the last 20 plus years of my life's work and put it all into one massive course. In the cert, you'll learn how to use my R7 system to create seamless, integrated, and efficient programs for clients and athletes of all shapes and sizes. You'll learn the exact progressions, regressions, and coaching cues I use in the gym to help your clients squat, hinge, press, and pull with awesome technique. You'll learn my streamlined assessment process that will help you determine the exact movements your clients should be performing when they come in the gym. And last but not least, you'll learn how to create relationships and build rapport with virtually everyone you train so you can get the best possible results. 
Of course, there's a lot more that I cover, but that should give you a pretty good idea of what the cert is all about. Now here's the thing, spots for the cert only open twice per year for a limited time. But if you join my free insiders list now, you'll be able to save $200 when my next group opens. To get on the insiders list, just head over to completecoachcertification.com. Again, that's completecoachcertification.com and then stay tuned for our launch emails very soon. Thank you so much for your support and I hope you'll join us when the next complete coach certification launches. Aaron, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Super excited to have you on. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, Mike, no, I appreciate you having me on again for the, for the second time. And, um, you know, thinking about, you know, my journey and my career, it always goes back to, I got my start as a mediocre weightlifting athlete at, at IFAS. And it, not, not, that was all my fault because of my, my genes and, and talent. Um, but yeah, so it's always cool to, to be able to reconnect and, um, you know, kind of go back to the homeland, so to speak. Yes. Um, but yeah, started off uh, in the world of weightlifting, um, you know, competing as an athlete, kind of transition into the coaching space, spent a lot of time developing as a coach in the sport of weightlifting, uh, transition more you know, getting an interest in more of the sports science realm, ended up pursuing my PhD at East Tennessee State University, uh, continuing to coach with the weightlifting program there, uh, taking on some sports science responsibilities during my time there. Um, you know, since then, uh, was able to kind of move into the baseball realm coming out of the PhD program, was fortunate to land as a sports science coordinator for the San Francisco Giants for one season, then moved on to the UFC Performance Institute in Las Vegas. So got to kind of change scenery and, and work in uh, the mixed martial arts world for a little bit. And then uh, now in my current role, going in my second season with the Cincinnati Reds as their director of applied sports science. So kind of been all over the place, um, you know, started off in weightlifting and thought that that's where I, I wanted to, to be and stay and develop. And life just has a you know, a way of its own and have been able to kind of navigate things and been fortunate with some some additional opportunities. So I love it, man. I love it. So talk to me. What's new since the last time we chatted? So obviously, I think you were going into the UFC. Now you're with the Reds. Talk to us a little bit yeah. about just that transition and maybe like what your day to day looks like right now. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, I mean, gosh, it's been a few years now. I think it was right around the the physical prep summit in, in the 2018 or I think it was 2018, maybe 2019. They all kind of meld together after a yeah, while. Yeah. Yeah. But I, 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 I remember I was like in the, the middle stages of the PhD program, um, you know, kind of going through that, as you mentioned, was getting ready to head over to the UFC for my first stint there as a, a strength and conditioning intern. Um, so took that opportunity to go over there, kind of wanted to expand my horizons beyond just the weightlifting realm, uh, challenge myself in some new spaces, uh, which MMA is probably like <laughs> as polar opposite as you can get from, from weightlifting in so many respects. Um, so yeah, finished that up, uh, ended up finishing the PhD. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, some of the other stops at the Giants and then now my current role here at the Reds. So Going into our second season, um, heading up our sports science department here at the Reds, uh, really kind of focused on implementing, you know, different processes around player development to help us track and monitor our players uh, moving through the player development system, um, supporting, you know, things on the skill side with pitching and hitting with our applied biomechanics initiatives, um, you know, get to interface with all the different elements from kind of top to bottom. I like to kind of characterize it as like we help facilitate like the vertical integ vert vertical integration from like the major league level through our different levels, our minor league affiliates, our our complex out in Arizona and our DR Academy. So that's like the vertical piece. Right. And then we have this horizontal integration piece that we really try to help facilitate across baseball operations. So that includes your like health and performance. Right. So your typical SNC, nutrition, athletic training, PT, mental performance, mental wellness. Um, you know, those sorts of things. And then we also have within baseball operations, things like scouting, you know, so on the pro scouting side, there's different things that we're able to focus on based off of some, some different technologies that are available. Um, and, you know, on the amateur scouting side with like the MLB draft combine, 
Um, and, you know, some of the work that our amateur scouts do when, when they're scouting players uh, and kind of supporting some of those things. So we kind of work top to bottom and then across the organization to really try to support as best we can, you know, all the coaching staff, the practitioners, you know, the scouts, the front office and all that sort of stuff. Um, so really exciting to have our be able to have our hands in a lot of different areas and really try to find ways to, um, you know, just provide support uh, for all of those different initiatives. Yeah, that's awesome, man. It sounds like you uh, you got a lot of irons in the fire, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. It's definitely it's it's uh, tough to, to keep track of sometimes, but, um, you know, have a lot of really great support staff. Um, you know, I think our team within our sports science department have a lot of really great staff on board, um, a lot of support from our front office, from our coaching staff and, and other leadership. So I think we're we're set up pretty well. Uh, to to really actually try to implement things and, and set things up to to make an impact in all those areas. Awesome. Okay, so if anybody is interested, I'll put a link to the show notes if they want to listen to our previous episode. But obviously, you and I went back and forth before this. Really want to dive into the sports science side, and I think one of the things that you mentioned going into this was you talked a little bit about your goals with the Reds and how one of your big focus or foci was to make sports science people-driven versus data-driven. Now, I love that, but I also feel like a lot of people would say, oh yeah, our our program's athlete-centric, but how do you go about distinguishing that? Or what do you feel like differentiates your program maybe from other programs you've seen or, or, you know, are out there? Yeah, you know, that's a a really great question. I think it's it's a good one to start off with. But as you mentioned, like, I think everybody says that they're athlete centric. And I really think, you know, everybody means it, you know? Um, But I think to me, being people driven versus data driven in sports science, it it goes beyond the athlete centric side of things, right? Like, of course, we're all here, coaches and support staff, we're here to support the athletes and to do everything we can to support our athletes. You know, everybody wants their athletes to do well, You know, but the fact of the matter is that coaches, different practitioners, organizations, they've been supporting athletes for decades, if not centuries before, (laughs) you know, sports science ever really became a thing. Right. Right. And then, you know, in the modern era of sport, you know, sports science is like kind of entered the picture and more and more organizations are are trying to adopt sports science or have sports science departments. Um, And I think like with a lot of things, you try to add in what you feel like you've been missing and you know, for so long, uh, you know, I think the focus was, has been, you know, people relying on their intuition and their feel and, you know, just kind of that observation that comes with decades of experience, right? They, you don't necessarily have the data to back that up. And so as like sports science started to become a thing and you look toward what pieces are we missing, we're missing objective data and we're finally starting to get technology that can allow us to capture all of this objective data. And so it's like the pendulum was so long, you know, on this one side of intuition and feel. And just I feel like the knee jerk reaction was right now we all have all this cool technology and, and whatnot and we can collect all these cool things. And it just swung the other way to like focusing on the data. And, you know, now we're collecting all this information without really knowing what we're getting out of it. Other yeah. than the fact that we're getting this new data that we don't have. Right. And I, I think that really that's the wrong approach or at least it's too crude of an approach to like think that data is going to solve all your problems um you know because the fact of the matter is like coaches and organizations have been successful right (laughs) without this stuff before right so it's not like sports science or objective data is this magic pill that once you have it you know you're going to start doing amazing things um you know at the end of the day you're going back to that the centric thing like being a coach is all about it all hinges on your relationship with the athlete right and same thing as a practitioner whether you're an at or a dietitian or strength coach or whatever whatever your role is like your ability to have an impact has to do with your ability to build a relationship with that athlete and to you know to create meaningful change with that athlete and so you know part of our view of sports science and what we're trying to do here at the reds is to you know identify specific initiatives uh, you know, that or technologies that we can use to either benefit our coaches and our practitioners hands on time with the athletes or to generate a touch point with the athlete. Mm-hmm. And it's all about trying to build 
or set the stage for an, a person's ability to build a relationship with an athlete. And you can only do that with that interaction, yeah. right? And so we're all about trying to drive that coach or practitioner interaction with the athlete. And so, you know, that doesn't mean that like you shouldn't look at data or data can't be useful, right? But that doesn't mean that if you do a specific test or you use a specific piece of technology or looking at a specific metric, that doesn't mean that like you're doing sports science, right? Like you're not a great coach or a great practitioner because you know how to run a force plate or you know how to do a T-test, right? You're great because of your ability to leverage any piece of information to improve your coaching or to influence how you coach or interact with an athlete. Yeah. Right. And so it's your ability to use the information. It's not your ability to generate the information necessarily. Now we can kind of get into the nuts and bolts, like depending on the setting that you're in, you know, private sector versus industry, um, you know, the size of your organization, the number of different departments or staff or headcount that you have, like some of those things might dictate who might be responsible for running the force plate or generating this report or, or sure. you know, doing X, X, Y, or Z. But that's going to be a lot more dependent on kind of the the resources that you have within your specific setting. But again, yeah, it's, it's really just like trying to align everybody to this idea of using whether it's technology or a specific initiative or approach to really amplify like our hands-on time with the athlete is what it all boils down to. Yeah. Okay. So this is like the million dollar question, right? Because we've absolutely gone from everything subjective and, and we know that a lot of those coaches, when you put objective data, objective data behind it, like they're right, right. They don't always know why they're right, but you know, their intuition and their feel uh, has allowed them to be successful. But this is the million dollar question. Like how do we blend the subjective and the feel and the intuition that these coaches have cultivated with the objective data that we have now to really try and get the best of both worlds. Cause I agree you can't live on the subjective end, right? Because we've got too much great data out there. And at the same time, like you said, it's crude to just rely on the numbers and act like we're dealing with robots. So how exactly. do you go about doing this? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's another great question. I mean, I, I feel like we're sports science or sports scientists can go wrong a lot of times is, you know, thinking that just because they have objective information and even if it's like the best quality, like gold standard, whatever, you know, information that that is somehow more inherently valuable than the coach or practitioner experience. Like yeah. in, in some ways it, it may be if we're talking about like the decision-making process and whatnot, but like really for me, Again, going back to the fact that sports existed for centuries in, in you know, different forms, right? Yep. And people have navigated how to coach or develop athletes in, in these different settings with or without sports science. Um, you know, and so especially in the world of baseball, you know, it's a, a really old game. It's got a lot of history to it. A lot of coaches today, they've you know got decades of experience as an athlete, you know, at the highest levels and also as a coach at the highest levels. Like you can't discount that experience. Yeah. You know, um, I always think back to it was Sackett who kind of defined like the modern approach to evidence based practice. Right. And the three kind of primary elements around that are, you know, the scientific research, the clinical expertise and experience, and then like the patient or uh, individual values. Yeah. Right. So there's three different things there. Only one of those is like, quote unquote, objective data. The right. other part of it is that coach, you know, that coach experience. Coaches that have been doing it for a while or have been doing it really well, like they've figured out how to do a lot of things really, really well. And there's some things that just continue to be challenging for them that, you know, there's problems that are just, they they just can't come up with a, with a good solution for any number of reasons. Um, and so for me, one of the key things is to really like, to be able to listen to what their challenges are, whether it's a new challenge that they've just encountered or something that's kind of existed historically within, you know, their experience or within that organization or within that sport. Um, and using that as a starting point for all right, what's important to try to solve. Well, if they're experiencing these challenges day in and day out, like we should probably start there. Right. Like me coming, like, why should we start with anything that I care about when they have all these other things that they're actually dealing with and they've been dealing with for, uh, for, for a while. And so 
I think that's one area that I really try to uh, emphasize is really understanding like what are the existing problems and challenges that are just not being dealt with effectively or addressed effectively and using, you know, focusing on those. Um, and then through conversation and like, you know, developing that relationship with them, being able to learn, you know, what are some of the additional challenges and, and also being able to recognize when we're interested in the same thing, but we're coming at it from different perspectives, sure. right? Like me coming from a weightlifting background, like Olympic sports and like from Mike Stone at ETSU, like periodization, like I, I look at training through a, a periodization lens, right? Yeah. You know, and, and so think about like the, the calendar year and how we might distribute things and, and, you know, divide things up. Well, a coach who, you know, the team's been playing for, you know, 14 days in a row and they've had two, you know, flights during that 14 day period to get to the next location you know, after a game, like they're worried about trying to put together a roster right for the next game like they don't care about you know timelines and, and all this sort of stuff like, we're both interested in the same thing how do we make sure that our athletes are prepared to play you know game 15 16 17 you know there's 162 game season um and so it's like trying to rec be able to recognize those similarities where we're looking at the same problem from different perspectives and then establish that common ground and, and then learn like again how are they thinking about the problem so that you can use their language and, and try to, you know, try to attack things or, or address things from their perspective as much as possible. Yeah, I love that. All right, my friend, quick break in this episode to remind you about the upcoming Complete Coach Seminar. It's going to be March 24th through 26th, Seattle, Washington, at my guy, Luca Hasavar's gym. Basically, whatever you want to learn about with regards to coaching, queuing, program design, we will cover it there. It's a two and a half day event and we're gonna run the gamut. We're gonna start by talking about the assessment process, how to make it more meaningful, how to help use your assessment to write better programs. From there, we're gonna take a day, day and a half, and we're really gonna lock in on progressions, regressions, coaching cues, how to make all of your clients and athletes move better. So if you wanna learn more about the seminar, go to completecoachcertification.com forward slash seminar. Again, that's completecoachcertification.com forward slash seminar. I hope to see you there. Now let's get back to this episode with Aaron. Okay, so answer this for me. Did you play baseball growing up? No. Okay. No, I, 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 yeah, I, I always joke with people like when I first got, when I got my first role with the Giants moving into baseball, um, like, I don't think cumulatively my entire life had I watched nine innings of baseball like, <laughs> up until that point, right? Like I was, was not a baseball guy. Like, you know, I'm still not a baseball person, like in terms of time in the, watching the sport and, right. and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I certainly didn't get hired because I, of my knowledge about baseball. Right. Um, but it, it's been a, a fun space to, to try to learn and grow in for sure. Okay. So here's why I asked that, right? Because when I... <laughs> got into soccer. I mean, soccer wasn't a thing when I was growing up, right? Like I played like mm -hmm. YMCA soccer when I was in like first and second grade. And then it wasn't even an opportunity really until my senior year of high school didn't play. I played some in college. Intramurals, by the way, intramurals, <laughs> not, not like at a high level, but it's weird, right? Because you're stepping yeah. into this space. You don't know the culture. You don't know the sport. So yeah. I'm interested because you're not just stepping into like the junior varsity team at whatever Cincinnati high school is down there, right? Like you're stepping into a professional organization, whether it's the Giants or the Reds. So how do you go about asking some of these questions, right? And cultivating these relationships because you don't have that bond of, oh, I grew up playing baseball. I know everything. I might, you know, I've got this huge baseball card collection and we can talk <laughs> baseball all day. How do you start to have these conversations with these lifers that have been in the game for 30, 40, 50 years? Yeah, no, it's, it's tough for sure. Like, it's something that definitely takes a lot of humility and leaving your ego at the door. Um, you know, I recognize fully, like I'm self-aware enough to know that I have very little sports specific expertise coming in. Uh, and same thing for, for the UFC, right? Like I, I wasn't an MMA, MMA person yeah. before that. Um, 
but that was for me that was like part of the allure and excitement of moving into these roles is like trying to come into these new spaces and, and challenge myself in these new spaces so i think from the get-go like i had this mentality and approach of like really being hungry to learn um but i think that it really starts with that like coming in with with no ego um just really being willing to take a back seat and to just shut up and listen you know to be frank like yeah. uh, i spent a lot of time just observing like being uh you know conscientious of like going to batting practice or going to a bullpen session you know being around the field and, and what these guys are doing on a day in and day out basis like not just being the testing guy or the data guy right right like, um i think that's that's super important and you want to make yourself present at these at these different things so that you can again just observe what's going on listen and see and feel you start to hear like how these you know coaches give a specific cue to a, to a player right or you know maybe they're working on on their swing and you know they're working on on some specific aspect and you just notice that they're just using the same cue and like you try to like eavesdrop and be a fly on the wall and try to overhear like what the conversation that they're having is. And then, you know, being able to have the feel to know like when the right time is to, to go have a conversation with the coach, like, all right, as we're picking up after the session, uh, you know, the, the players have moved on to the next activity, the coaches are kind of picking up, you know, so I would stay around to help pick up the balls after batting practice and use that as an opportunity to kind of, well, hey, I, I noticed you mentioned this to the player, like, you know, what what exactly were you working on? And we'll try to, like, start to get those breadcrumbs and, and, you know, learn a little bit more. And then the next day go in and, like, remembering, taking notes off of what we had our, our conversation on the day before and, like, just continuing to build the conversation and add more substance to the conversation. Um, and so for me, that's been that's been an effective way to really go about learning about the game, um, to build a conversation, to, you know, again, show that you're engaged and that you're interested. Um, at no point in time was I ever like, Oh, well, I think you should use this cue or what do you think about doing this or that? Like, you know, at, at the most, you know, maybe with, you know, take again, swinging a bat, right. There's, we have a device that's called the blast, uh, sensor. It's a, it sits on the end of the bat handle and it basically gets like the bat plane and like bat swing kinematics, okay. uh, during the swing. Right. So for me, that's very similar to my work with weightlifting of looking at barbell trajectory. Yeah. Like you're basically looking at the tra trajectory of the, the baseball bat. And so like, I might use that as a launching point to establish some commonality. Hey, like I noticed, you know, you were talking about this from the blast, um, you know, that sounds a little bit like, you know, what I did or this type of technology that we did with weightlifting and like try to establish, you know, bring the conversation forward that way. Yeah. Um, so again, it's like trying to find areas where you do have overlap, but it's again, just from a different perspective and being able to recognize where those uh, intersections lie. Um, but again, it's, it, it's about being like piecemeal and not trying to to be best friends with the, with the, with the coach right away. Like right. you start small, you know, and, and just let things kind of take shape organically, but by being intentional about putting yourself in the right place at the right time. And, um, you know, just being present and you know, being a good person <laughs> it yeah. goes a long way. Right. Uh, I know it's easier said than done, but, uh, yeah. So it's funny that you say this because as my kids are getting <laughs> older and they're getting into the skill development side, like Cade, uh, has a hitting lesson like once a week, you know, once-ish a week, <laughs> Kindle's into soccer. So it's fun watching these coaches because, again, they're coming at it from a skill-based perspective. And a lot of times things that you see or that you would correct a certain way from being in the weight room or, or being around Olympic weightlifting, you know, maybe it's a little bit different approach, but they're trying to tackle the same thing from the skill development side of things. Yeah. And so I think that's fun when you see that – that carryover and that overlap and you have these like broader connections of like, Oh mm -hmm. no, like I see that too, but that's how they address it in their sport. So I think that's like yeah. a really powerful moment for us as coaches. But one other thing that you mentioned, and I, and I think this is important because unless you're one of these people where you grow up and you play a certain sport and then you, you know, do a graduate assistantship with that sport and you go into that sport, like at some point you're going to be exposed to something you haven't been around. Right. Uh, and for me, probably the, the biggest 
uh, step out of my comfort zone was when I did like some combine based training. Because one, I'm not a football guy. And number two, I knew nothing about the combine. But what I did first, and I think this is probably something that a lot of people could, could benefit from, I didn't try and learn anything other than what are the tests. Not what are other people doing, not how are they you know, trying to skin the cat. What are the tests and how would I approach it? And I took like a month doing that. And I had some, some pretty decent results. But then now I'm going to go talk to Lauren Landau, who's like world famous combine guy. Nick Winkleman was working for Exos. So now what that allows me to do is it, it allows me to have some skin in the game, number one. But number two, I cultivate my own thought process. So when I'm having these discussions with them and I'm like, oh, I tried this and it worked really well. And they're like, oh, I've never tried that. That's awesome. You see what I'm saying? So like it allows for you to come at things from a fresh perspective, because sometimes if something has been done for an extended period of time, like there's like this indoctrinated way of doing things. So sometimes yeah. it's helpful to come at it from a fresh perspective. So, you know, again, for sure, you weren't like a trained cage fighter going into the UFC. <laughs> yeah. Still not. But <laughs> <laughs> You're not tapping guys out on your, your free no, time. No. But no. I mean, I think there's yeah, value but, in that, right? Like coming at it from a fresh sure. outside perspective, yeah. you know, having some of your own thoughts and then integrating what they're doing and trying to figure out where is their synergy and where is there yeah. that potential to really move the needle on things maybe people haven't taken a look at before. Yeah, you know, that's a great point. That's something that I think looking at the world of baseball, um, especially a few years ago, I think, you know, the perception of a lot of the coaches in baseball, like the older coaches that, you know, they're very traditional and kind of stuck in their ways. But one of the things that's been really refreshing and I mean, honestly, it's been, it's really admirable to see like just how willing most of these guys are to continue to get better and to learn. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think a lot of organizations more and more are realizing exactly what you're talking about of like the value of having an outside perspective of, you know, this is the way we've been doing it like may it may or may not have been working but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the way we should continue to do things yeah um and so i think partly due to sports science being a more developed uh process internationally than in the u.s yeah i think you naturally like as organizations are looking to adopt you know a sport science approach or to you know bring sports scientists into the organization like you naturally have that infiltration of you know outsiders so to speak just because a lot of sports scientists coming in to these organizations are coming from you know international you know organizations or or um other countries in, in different sports and so they're not necessarily coming from a baseball background or yep. uh, you know a soccer background or even within soccer like a lot of the sports scientists are coming over from european you know organizations right so uh i think that that's part of it but then you're also just getting really progressive leadership it you know realizing the value that again you know you hear it all the time with you know thinking about hiring and you know the value of diversity and like a diverse you know workforce and yeah. group and i think part of that again stems you know or relates to having people coming in from outside the sport that aren't kind of steeped in the sport, uh, being able to bring that fresh perspective. Yep. Okay. So one thing I'd love to hear from you about are measurables that you have found to be helpful when it comes to sports science in baseball. Because again, I'm not around that sport nearly as much, but in soccer or basketball, Maybe they look at change of direction, accelerations, decelerations, total distance covered, time played, whatever. But in your world, what are some of the measurable and probably even more important, what are the impactful KPIs that you guys have found and that you want to track? Yeah, so I think, you know, a big emphasis for us within the world of baseball is player development, right? You have the whole minor league system, which the goal ideally is to take a younger player and develop them through the system into a big league player. Yep. Um, and so with that, one of our primary initiatives is uh, quote unquote, like athlete monitoring, where you're trying to take you know a lot of measurements over the course of your time with the athlete to, to get a, you know, frequent, you know, uh, indication of where they are, how they're progressing and all that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, and so like really through like long-term monitoring of these different characteristics, whether they're you know physical or mental or performance-based, 
Um, you know, I think we're probably not doing anything terribly different than others. Like we're interested in, you know, development of strength, development of power, development of speed, the skill acquisition side of things, especially for our younger guys, how do we develop skill? And so identifying like specific KPIs, like we use the, you know, standard stuff, you know, that most organizations have these days. They all, everybody probably uses sports plates with, you know, some sort of jump testing, maybe, you know, some isometric strength testing, you know, through an ISO squat or an ISO mid thigh pull, um, things like grip strength, we track body composition, um, you know, different things related to kind of mental skills and mental performance, uh, you know, don't necessarily have like screens that we give, uh, but there may be specific like characteristics or like a, an approach at the plate that we want a hitter to take or that our, our mental performance group wants our hitters to, to try to take. Mm-hmm. And we can, can kind of check in, in in different ways through like, you know, one-on-ones with that athlete of, of how they're doing, you know? And so from the force plate stuff, like, like I said, you know, your standard counter movement jump testing, like there's, you know, a million different metrics. I mean, everybody yeah. probably has their own, like ours center around, you know, things like impulse and, um, you know, obviously looking at differences between eccentric and, and concentric side of things. But, you know, again, for us, we're trying to frame things from that long-term development, like player development standpoint. Yep. Um, and so like, when I think about like, what variables are we tracking? Well, part of it depends on the athlete and what stage of the career they're at. Um, you know, not to try to dance around, <laughs> around the question. Yeah. Um, uh, but I mean, realistically, uh, you know, like looking at on the amateur side, if we have a, a kid coming out of Latin America, right? Like a 15, 16 year old high school age kid, they're probably skinny as a string bean, uh, probably pretty weak, but maybe they throw just either yeah. with really high velocity or, you know, they, they're just amazing with their command, whatever the case may be. Like, we know that we're probably going to focus regardless of what their skill side is like on the physical development piece, right. And like getting their body as they go through the physical maturation, that's going to take place over the next number of years. Um, Like just making sure that we're supporting that physical development in a way that will hopefully, you know, build them a resilient and robust body for once they make it, you know, to the big leagues, you know, for a high school kid coming out of the U S maybe they're already exposed to a strength training program. So, you know, so the skill development piece, you know, what we're still going to focus on it, but the the floor is a little bit higher with them. Yeah. Um, you know, so we've done some analysis and, and there's similar studies that have actually been published out there on kind of like the developmental curve of some of these physical characteristics, like, you know, strength and power and speed and those sorts of things. Um, you know, so it's nothing that's not, it's pretty consistent with uh, what's previously been found where you see, you know, a lot of gains in that like, 18 to early 20 year old period in all of the different characteristics. And then you start to see a plateau in those characteristics, like nothing earth shattering. Um, But using that information to say like, okay, this seems to be a pretty prime window, you know, whether it's just like the natural um, way things would unfold with the physical maturation process, or because like it's a really prime developmental w- window where if we focus and hammer on it, like we're going to make really awesome gains, you know, during this younger period. And as they get, you know, older into their, you know, twenties, maybe we can start to identify the specific, you know, physical characteristics that will benefit this athlete. Like for this athlete, maybe it's more of a strength focus or for him, it's more of a power focus or this one, it's more of a mobility focus all the while understanding that like baseball is one of the most skill dominant sports. You know, I think it's been awesome to work in both MMA and baseball, which to me are two of, if not the most skill dominant sports out there, Um, you know, as to where like that skill, if you don't have that skill of being able to put bat to ball or to locate your pitch, like it doesn't matter how hard you throw or like how much you squat or whatever, like, if you don't have the skill to take yeah. advantage of that physical capacity, then you're not going to be getting much playing time, right? Or you're not going to move up through, through the different levels. Um, and so I think that's another I- interesting layer to kind of add on top of the KPI conversation. You know, yeah. if we're looking at specific KPIs, well, from a health and performance standpoint, like 
yeah, we can track and demonstrate that, you know, our strength program is getting guys better in these specific areas or from a, you know, nutrition standpoint and collaboration with our SNC guys that we're making progress. But in order to like, tie that to actual on-field outcomes, that's the tricky part. And um, that's where, you know, the conversation has to become a little bit more nuanced to where you can't just say like, yeah, we need to track, you know, concentric impulse. And, you know, if we track that and they improve that, like we're good to go. Like, okay, we know that if they have a decent concentric impulse or improve that, like theoretically that should improve to toward activities that also have some sort of, uh, you know, fast, concept of impulse type yeah. uh, component to them. Um, so, yeah. I love it. Okay. So follow up to this, because I think that is helpful, right? And I think probably most of us are barking up the same trees with yeah. regards to like KPIs and things that, that we think are impactful with regards to sport performance. But this just came to mind when it comes to readiness, and hopefully you can can speak to this, but I mean, I think Eric Cressy told me at one point it's 162 games in about 180 days. Like, that is a compressed window of performance. It's insane. (laughs) So can you speak at all to how you guys are tracking readiness or trying to monitor this at some level, right? Because I think that's fascinating. Like, how do you make sure guys are ready to perform on any given day? Yeah, that's, I think, one one of the biggest challenges to baseball um i think it has the most grueling competition schedule yeah. out of all the major sports right and um i think whether it's baseball or, or any other you know major sport like the game is the game right the season like 162 games like the game doesn't care if you're ready to play 162 <laughs> games or not yeah right yeah um and so for for me, like the way I think about it is we have a, you know, a group of guys and like they're each prepared, like their body is capable of handling X amount of games. Right. right. And so we can take historical data to kind of look at, you know, from a in-game workload standpoint, like, all right, what is the typical like distances of like high speed running? What's the typical, you know, number of, high intensity throws that this guy you know produces during during the game or over the course of a season like what's the variance you know within that um and then using that information to start to get a feel for like what this guy is capable or built up to Mm -hmm. being able to handle and then using that in the off season now we can say like all right we know that you are you know, unless they have a history of injury, which opens up a, a whole different line of questions, right? But yep. assuming, you know, they're healthy, like you are built up to withstand at least this amount of work, mm-hmm. right? And so like we can, you know, you have the off season, you ramp down, like we can, we can try to ramp you back up and progress your workload to at least be there. Ideally, we want to like increase that ceiling sure. and, and make you tolerant to more. Um, and so from a like, a macro standpoint like that's one way to look at it and then when we get to like in the season when you're like in the grind you know <laughs> on, on the day-to-day basis then it's very much more of a like just relying again on that that relationship with the athlete whether it's the strength coach has a, a great relationship or they're in the training room a lot or you know you relying on your coaching staff because they have the best relationship with the athlete like, just trying to get a feel for how they're feeling how they're doing um you know continuing to monitor uh kind of the in-game workload and use that like if we notice that they're either they're trending toward the higher end all right our goal is to keep them on the field as much as possible yep right and so like what can we do either proactively or or even a lot of cases reactively to help keep them on the field and not have to pull them off the field. Yep. Right. So maybe that's recommending some additional recovery modalities or a specific recovery modality. And maybe that's, you know, we look at their body weight and we notice some changes there. So, you know, we, we bring the dietitian into the conversation as well to provide some additional calories and energy for that player to support them. Um, you know, our SNC coaches are great as far as like being able to, um, you know, balance out what, they're asking players to do in the weight weight room in response to what's going out on on the field 
Uh, you know, some cases maybe we notice that, like, especially with regard to the high speed running, that in games they're just not getting a lot of exposure to high speed runs. So we know that we have to top them off yep. in practice to kind of maintain that. Um, and so those are a few of the kind of different ways that we look at it. Um, it's hard. It's harder at the at the big league level, um, just with you know things like the aura ring to try to you know track you know sleep and things like that and like the the game schedule and the travel schedule alone is like enough to to blow up any sort of hey get get eight hours of sleep like right. that's one of the things like that that drives me up the wall or like everybody knows sleep's important everybody knows that like our all of our lives would be better if we got eight hours of sleep but that's not always the reality of yeah. what we're able to do right if you're playing a night game and you know it goes until you know 10 11 o'clock at night and then you have to travel you know you know the next day or just whatever like you can't physically yeah. get eight hours of sleep a lot of times or like you're just your adrenaline is so high and it takes you a while to come down before you can actually fall asleep so maybe you're not getting to sleep till two three o'clock in, in the morning um you know it's very much less than ideal conditions and then don't get me started on like uh, avoid caffeine nine hours before bed like <laughs> You're going to tell your starting pitcher, your reliever to not take cap. Like if that's what gets them, you know, yeah. ready to perform like at this level. And this isn't the case at every level, but at this level, like performance is the name of the game. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. I cannot ask somebody to not take caffeine if that's something that, you know, they feel is going to contribute to their performance because that's food on the table for them. That's their contract. That's their livelihood. Right. And so yeah. like, there's a there's a quote by uh, the economist Thomas Sowell: "There are no solutions, only trade-offs." And I feel like in like this that. world, it's you know you're living that every day, right? It's like, all right, he may not the, the caffeine he ingests it, you know, a couple hours before the game. That's you know within the nine hour window, but like that's going to help him perform. Like you know, maybe that's a trade-off some people are willing to take. Maybe not. It's kind of you know there's no set threshold of like what's acceptable or not acceptable in a lot of cases. There's a lot of, a lot of gray area. Yeah. It's, I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's something until I started working with the Indy 11, I really didn't grasp was like, okay, like as a fan, yeah, you want to go to a game seven to nine 30, you go home, you're in bed at 11, whatever. Yeah. But these guys, okay, well they have shower, Right. They might have to lift depending on the sport, depending on what they have to do. They might have media responsibilities. But like you said, a lot of these guys are so jacked up. Right. And, and not in a negative way. They're just, you know, the, the adrenaline of playing a yeah. sport. Right. Like you said, they go home. Maybe they're not falling asleep till two or three and then they have to be back the next day. Even if you have something at 10. Like, mm-hmm. That's six hours of sleep. Like we know that's yeah. not ideal, but that is the schedule. And that's how yeah. kind of the the cards play out. So you have to just know and understand that and then start to work around that. Something else that I thought was interesting, and I've had numerous guys talk to me about this, but you know, a lot of people from the outside talk about, oh, well, if I worked with that team, we'd have them, you know, on the (laughs) HRV every day and we'd have them do, you know, readiness jump testing every day. Like that sounds great until in your world, right? It's game 120 of 160, right? You are grinding Okay, come on, Joe, let's get on this force plate. Or in the NBA, game 75 out of 80 in a regular season. All right, let's get these jump tests in. Nobody wants to do that. you know. So it sounds great, right? And we can all agree, like, yes, that would be great if we could get our athletes to do that at 100%. But the reality is it just doesn't always work out like that. Yeah, for sure. And that's not to mention the the CBA, right? The collective right. bargaining agreement. It's like good luck getting your forty man guys to <laughs> to wear the O ring or whatever other you know monitoring device that you want. Like some of them will, but a lot right. of them are just going to tell you to to get lost. Right? <laughs> so it's like, but yeah, yeah. Okay. So something else you said before the show really intrigued me. So I'd like to touch on this point. You talked about relying on our natural tendencies to create engagement. What did you mean by that? Yeah, that's uh, so. This is something that I kind of lucked into last year, um, and this kind of goes back to the the people driven uh, sports science, where like, it's not always about you know doing these different tests or collecting data, right? Like, very much want to also be a resource or to be able to provide resources to our coaches and to our players. Um, 
And so, like I said, this is something I looked into last year with something that we were trying to roll out with uh, something related to our sleep initiative, where, again, going back to the demands of of the game and the travel, um, one of the things that we did was uh, distribute or provide these sleep kits, these travel sleep kits to all of our players and staff in the organization. And they're nothing fancy, uh, just really something basic. It's like a you know a travel bag. It's got a really nice sleep mask in there. There's earplugs. There is blue light blocking glasses for at night. There's you know lavender spray. There is stickers to cover up any of the LED lights in your room, in your hotel room. There's clips to shut the block uh, the curtains. You know if there's yeah. a gap. You know different things to try to help make the best of a crap situation when you're living life on the road, right? Yeah. Um, and then another thing that we had for at the big league level were um, the the water cooling uh, mattress pads. Yeah. So it's like a mattress pad that you have and fill it with water, and it, it helps regulate your body temperature as you sleep to to improve a lot of different things. Um, and so we were having these things. Um, we're we're waiting for them to come in, right? And had had an opportunity to to talk to. Uh, both our minor league players and our, our major league players about some of the different things, including the, the sleep resources that we were wanting to provide them. And I had after uh, a couple of days after I had that talk with them, you know, had one or two guys come up and ask like, Hey, when are we getting those, those mattress pads in? Or, Hey, when are those, when are the sleep kit, kits coming in? And I was like, yeah, you know, we're we're gonna get them shipped to Cincinnati because the team was uh, actually starting on the road, I think, in Atlanta, and um, then they were going back to Cincinnati for their home opener. So I was like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna ship them to Cincinnati so that you know when you're back for the first home series, we'll give them out then. And so kind of like putting it off a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. And then same thing for the sleep kits. Like we had an order and like we ran out, and so we had to order more. Um, and then I noticed like another you know few people would come up like hey when are, when are we getting this and then you know fast forward a, a couple of weeks we're in Cincinnati uh, it's coming toward the end of the the first home home series and we just had some delays to because of some different things and uh, again noticed some guys like hey when are we getting this <laughs> and, and it was different guys it wasn't just the same guys like it was right. more it was more guys um, and so like I noticed like this this tendency of not wanting to feel like you're missing out on getting something or, yeah. you know, like that, that was kind of the first thing, right. And like, I just noticed more and more, like these people are, are really interested in getting this resource and like you're dangling the carrot on the stick, which is like making them curious and like worried that they're not getting something. And right. so like, uh, uh, so I guess, like I said, it was kind of just lucked into it. Like I just noted, happened to notice that like more and more people were asking about it. And then when we finally did roll it out, um, you know, it was really well received. Uh, a lot of guys, you know, they they you know took took the product. Um, some of them weren't that interested in it, which is fine. Like it's not for everybody. Sure. Um, and then you know, a few weeks later, you know, had some of the guys that you know chose not to take the the device. You know, at first they came back and like, hey man, I heard you know about you know so and so is talking about this, and you know, do you still have some? And I was like, yeah. And so then you know, we got to a point where all right, we ran out and like now people are feeling like, oh, they missed out on the window to get them. And, like, yeah. so, you know, so you're just using that, uh, um, you know, that tendency, like, which really helped to, to get people interested in, and drive conversations around sleep with our players. Um, and so that was kind of, you know, uh, just a funny story. Like I said, just happened to, to luck into that realization of, of um using that type of carrot on a stick approach yeah. to drive engage or get guys interested. Um, and especially something around, so again, like we talked about before, right? The messaging is always this, you know, get eight hours and do this, that, and like, you're just rolling your eyes and like people are <laughs> sick to death about hearing how important sleep is because we, we get it. Right. Right. And so around a topic like that, you know, to be able to, to generate some interest or curiosity, uh, to now where they're coming to you to ask about, you know, different sleep strategies or, you know, what can they do to come down off of the game afterward? And so, you know, that's an opportunity to link them up with our mental performance, you know, staff to work on some, you know, whether it's meditation or mindfulness or some deep breathing stuff, you know, maybe it's an opportunity to link them up with our SNC staff to work on some different, you know, mobility flows that they can do to come down. Um, you know, so again, kind of going back to that, 
using these different initiatives, whether it's on the testing side or the you know, providing resources side to drive those touch points with the athletes, with, with specific people. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And it made me think of a couple different anecdotes, but I think one of the big things is if you're around groups of athletes, like athletes talk, right? You have to understand athletes talk. So even if you have people that aren't interested initially, your high engagement people latch onto them and work with them because here's the most important thing. If you can demonstrate results, they're going to go to bat for you. You're not going to have to sit here and try and validate, oh man, I need you to do this and this and this. Like the people that are getting results, people notice and they're then they're asking questions, right? Well, hey, why is John, why is he jumping so high? Or why is he playing so well? And then you can come back to, well, because John's doing X, Y, and Z. And again, this yeah. is just like a, a, a way to kind of circumvent instead of having these awkward conversations and trying to like drive or impose your will on people. It's like, hey, just rock with the people that are interested, that are engaged, that do want to do these things. Let them have some success. And then hopefully some of those uh, slower adopters, if you will, will eventually see, oh, no, this really could benefit me. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's really important to, to acknowledge, like, every player wants to get better mm -hmm. and yeah. you know sometimes they they have to kind of go on their own journey to figure out how to do that or like yes. what is actually going to help them do that um and a lot of times you, like you just have to be willing to take a back seat and and let them go on their journey and, and come back to you when they're ready like you can't force it if they're not ready or if they don't believe in it um and so like you said kind of relying on the results of others to demonstrate the effectiveness of something or to to generate interest in something for for another player is super critical. Yeah. One other thing that that come, comes to mind is this idea of just like <clears throat> keep showing up because mm -hmm. again you're responsible for how many guys, right? When I worked with the Indy 11, we'd routinely have 25 guys. It's hard to imagine, but like if you work with a group that size, not everybody's going to be your best friend. Right. You know, and some guys just don't like SNC or they don't like sports science. But, you know, there was one guy in particular, he was playing really well for us. I didn't I didn't have a bad relationship with him. He just didn't want to work out like ever, yeah. like didn't want to work out. But I kept showing up, you know, every session. Hey, what's up, man? Gave him knuckles. Well, lo and behold, September came. He had a back injury. I was the first person he wanted to talk to. So, you know, just keep yeah. showing up because you just never know when somebody's going to be ready to to really like figure out, okay, what's Aaron or what's Mike? What are they all about? Mm -hmm. How can they help me? So, right. Yep. So as somebody that's really trying to get back into the sports science game, you know, I took my little hiatus. I'm trying to get back in there now, but I'd love to hear your thoughts here because you and I both know sports science absolutely exploding right mm -hmm. now. What advice would you give to one, a new coach who's looking to get in the game or number two, I think this is even more interesting because it probably includes me. What do you say <laughs> to an old coach, right, who wants to learn more, wants to get into it, but doesn't maybe know where to start? Yeah, that's that's a super big question <laughs> uh, because, like you said, there, the sports science space has just exploded and the technology space has just exploded. Like there's a million things out there. I think starting off, the biggest piece of advice is just like, know what you're trying to do like what are you what are you after are you trying to you know track you know improvements in strength or power are you trying to streamline you know if you do a lot of movement screens are you trying to find a solution for that you know like what are what exactly are you trying to do um and and this is partly related to like i think the approach that a lot of good sports scientists taken that I, I try to emulate is you know taking a problem solving approach and identify the problem that you're trying to solve and then use that to drive what the right solutions are or could be um but i think from a like on the tangible side of things like looking at the developments that have taken place over the last few years with like some of the hardware and technology um i think for the most part like most of the hardware out there uh for things like force plates, you know, your linear position transducers, like your gym aware type devices, uh, timing gates, heart rate monitors, like most of that type of hardware is pretty comparable, right? And you have yeah. a, you know, a few different key players in each of those spaces. 
you're not gonna like make or break your success if you go with one over the other they all do the same things reliably well right they give you good quality data um and there's plenty of guidance that you can get from you know current users out there or just like you know different you know blogs and tutorials and whatnot that you are probably already diving into to figure out which specific tech might fit you the best i think you know if you're trying to vet some technology you know the biggest area to to kind of be cautious around would be like video based motion analysis i know that mm -hmm. that's like a, a really um really hot like area of development uh right now um you know the software that you might use to help like automate a movement screen or you know do any sort of like technique analysis or those sorts of things like there's just a lot of limitations to that that mm -hmm. uh don't let yourself be oversold yeah uh, quite yet i i, I the, a lot of the technology is really close it's just i mean for me not not quite there uh for for most of the options that most consumers would have access to sure um and i think another thing like as you're vetting companies or like different technologies just stay away from anyone that promises to like the be the be all end all yes. uh you know company you know it, the saying of if it's too good to be true it probably is like that definitely uh rules in, in the sports science realm right and i think in my experience of talking to a lot of different you know companies the reputable ones and the ones that you can really lean on are those who are willing to like acknowledge the limitations of their product yes. or service yep. Um, they're not, they don't try to tuck it away and, and like act like there's everything's, you know, sparkles and, <laughs> and fairy dust, right? Like, yeah. um, they're, they're pretty upfront about their stuff. So I'd say that would be, you know, that problem solving approach, uh, for most of the hardware out there again, around like the, the you know, force plates and, and that sort of stuff are all pretty comparable. It's you know, a matter of preference and, and kind of workflow. Um, but I think that's probably another piece of advice is like, you know, especially for someone in your situation, Mike, right? Like you're running a business, right? Like you right. have that to worry about. You have your online athletes, you have your in-person athletes. And then now you're also going to be responsible for running, you know, any sort of data collection. And then the analysis, like thinking through like what actually all is involved. Yeah. If you were to adopt this to make the information come to life, it's not just, you know, you click the button and then like, poof, now you know what to do with it. Like right. somebody has, you have to look at it and interpret it and, and really dive in to, to figure out what it means. And, um, you know, maybe you have the bandwidth for that, maybe not. And like, you know, in, in some cases, maybe it's not worth bringing on a piece of tech. So right. I think really kind of thinking through that it is a, a really critical step as well. Great point. And something I definitely learned on my own the hard way because, you know, uh, as I got into, you know, getting our force plates and getting up and running there, I probably spent four to six months like diving in best practices with testing analysis, like got the goiniometer mm -hmm. out on that isometric <laughs> mid-dipole. But man, nobody told me like, hey, once I've got all this data, now I have to go in and like make sense of it, right? Yeah. And when I got 60 metrics to look at on just a counter movement jump, Right. Like there's a lot of information there. So now it's like, okay, this is like the next wave and I'm, I'm down with it. Cause I'm fascinated by it. And yeah. it kind of brings me back to my science based roots. But yeah, it's like, I think that's one of the biggest things is you have to be willing to be in it for the long game. Right. And understand mm -hmm. that there's sure. a lot to this. It's like the assessment, the interpretation, putting it back into a program now starting the whole process over and trying to see if your intervention actually worked. So mm -hmm. It's fun, mm -hmm. but it's a lot. Right. It's a lot. Yeah, it takes for time. Sure. For sure. Okay. So you've already done the big question. So I want to take this in a slightly different direction. If you got to stay with the Reds 10, 15, 20 years, build your ideal sports science program, how would that look and feel? Man, just got the crystal ball out, huh? Yeah, that's what I want. Um, I feel like we're, we've really gotten off to a great start of like identifying key places to start with right like, again as i mentioned before like a, a key focus on the athlete monitoring side and just giving us reliable information to evaluate if the systems you know from a physical development standpoint and a player development standpoint if we're like hitting the mark 
where we say we're, we're trying to hit the mark. I think that's such a, a critical process. Um, I think we've got some pretty good fundamentals in place in terms of like tests that we feel really confident in. Um, I think as we go through, you know, this year and following years, like just you know, refining the specific tests that we may or may not include or add or, or subtract yep. from the mix. Um, but I think we've got a reasonable like framework for our athlete monitoring processes. Um, one of the areas that I'm super excited for this year to really continue to make some strides in is our applied biomechanics piece. Mm-hmm. Um, where we have a lot of really cool technologies that um, with the right people in place, which I, I think we have some really talented and capable people that are that are uh, with us here in the organization to unlock the the insights that are part of that data. Um, you know, we're talking about pitching and, and hitting specific data. Um, I think that's the next area that I would really like to focus on this year. Um, and again, going back to the like coach and practitioner focus of making that information come alive for our pitching staff and our hitting staff, right? From yeah. a, whether it's from a, a like a health management or injury risk management standpoint or from a performance enhancement standpoint, like trying to identify how we can use that information uh, to support the skill development piece yeah. for, for pitching and hitting. Um, we had some some good milestones that we made last year uh, with respect to things like hitter specific you know, prep routines before they they get in the cage to to get ready for the day. Um, you know, same thing on the pitching side, just continuing to kind of build those out and, and make that a little bit more robust. Um, I think as we just continue to chug along. Uh, and refine our processes, just streamlining like our decision making processes where, you know, we know that in for this specific uh, for this specific initiative or this specific case, like these are our like, top five outcomes that we would usually choose from. Yeah. And I guess kind of like streamlining the decision trees or um, decision support systems that kind of feed into that. Uh, and building those out and yeah i think it's just reducing reducing the friction as much as possible to get from the data collection to the coach or practitioner using the information and making decisions based off the information like that's the long-term goal like that's always the goal um but like i said i think we've we've started with some really good fundamental processes in place that we'll just continue to build on for however long i get to be here that's awesome man i love it Okay, last but not least, as you'll recall, we got our lightning round. So five fairly yep. short questions. Your answer can be as long or short as you like. Number one, I feel like I asked you this last time, but we don't need yeah. to catch up. So I got to know, like, <laughs> how's the Olympic weightlifting going, man? Oh, man. So I, I just restarted working out again on Monday. <laughs> so good, great timing. Great timing, yeah. Um, you know, as we'll be out in, uh, in spring training starting on Monday for uh, six weeks, so need something to fill the days or like, you know, get my mind off of baseball 24 right. seven uh, for, for that period. So I started to kind of prepare and do a little return to fitness phase before, okay. uh, before going out there. So I just restarted during the season. I actually product got into a pretty good routine. Then the off season hit and uh, like, I think my wife gives me a hard time. <laughs> <about this. laughs> I'll, I'll use any excuse to like say, oh, my, my routine was thrown off. And, <laughs> you know, I got I to gotta take a break. <laughs> so I definitely uh, definitely use that excuse this offseason, but just started to get back into it again. You got to you gotta get right back into those sets of 10 squats, right? Where you That's just right. can't, yeah. oh, can't yeah. flex your knees for about three days straight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll be, be awesome sitting on the plane out to Arizona. I'm a masochist, though. I kind of like that. It's like, I feel like I earned sitting on my butt the the next day or so. Uh, Okay, number two, what was your biggest takeaway from your time working in the UFC? Yeah, man, that was that was a lot of fun. Like that that is a really cool place. As you know, you know, Duncan French, like amazing, probably one of the best, you know, sports scientists, high performance, you know, practitioners in the world yeah um like it was amazing to like be able to work alongside him every day and just like have conversations with him about what we're doing and trying to do 
Um, but I think the biggest takeaway that I got from the UFC was like, I got a lot of reps in making adjustments. Yeah. All right. Like no two athletes there are the same. No two fights are the same. Um, you know, you had worked with fighters that, you know, they just signed their contract and are getting ready for their first fight. We worked with fighters also that were on the other end of the spectrum that are getting ready for a title defense, right? Yeah. And then everything in between. And then you had the whole element of, you know, the different timelines of, you know, some fighters, they have a fight lined up, some don't. Uh, for the fighters that did have a fight lined up, you know, maybe the timeline gets thrown off because the opponent got injured or you get a short notice fight as a replacement fighter, like yeah. in two weeks or even that same week. And so from like a planning standpoint, um, it was a lot of fun of like trying to figure out how you how you handle all of those different scenarios or adjust to all of those different scenarios or changes that, that come up. Like it's just such a dynamic environment. Um, so that was like that was that was a lot of fun to to be able to get a lot of experience with and to like have to expose yourself to of making those adjustments on the fly. Um, especially as I mentioned before, like coming from like this very organized and, you know, periodization, you yeah. know, model, like how do you adapt that in, in the face of all those types of things? So, yeah. yeah. Well, you just think about the structure that leads up to a powerlifting meet or an Olympic lifting meet versus yeah. how chaotic fight sports are, how agile you have to be as a coach. Right. Because mm -hmm. like you said, all the different scenarios, all the things that could happen. And man, uh, I got to go out there. Joel put on a seminar out there in November. And man, that is a gorgeous facility that does yeah, not it's... suck. I, I, I could <laughs> I, I'd be OK going to work there every day. Yeah, it was it was it was it was awesome going into work every day for sure. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah it's a great place. It's, it's amazing. Duncan and I actually crossed paths. I was in my master's program. He was in the Ph.D. program at Ball State for mm -hmm. a year. And I was always uh -huh. like, hey, dude, you need a new intern? I'm, I'm, I'm in my 40s, man. I'm basically a young spring chicken. Bring me out, man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, he's fun. Okay, number three, how's dad life yeah. treating you? Dude, dad life is crazy. Like, it goes by so quick. I know. Our oldest, he just turned 11. We got an eight-year-old and a six-year-old. Um, it's crazy. Like, the middle one, he's he's doing competitive gymnastics. He's doing really well with that. It's it's been a lot of fun to see. And then both the boys, uh, they played little league this last year. Okay. Uh, so that that's been fun. And uh, you know, kind of going back to me not being a baseball person and like trying <laughs> to learn as much about the game. Like I'm sitting up at the fence when when they're having practice. You know, the coaches are working with kids, and it's in language that I can understand. Yeah. You know, very simple, right? Yeah. So I'm sitting there like learning just as much for me to learn about the game as, as the kids are. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no dad life sauce. It's, it's insane. Um, it's a lot of fun, but yeah, it goes by, it go it goes by so quick, um, yes. but it's good. Absolutely. Okay. Number four, when do I get to come down to, to Cincinnati and hang out? Hey man, you <laughs> name the time, you name the time and we'll make it happen. Uh, I'll be out, like I said, I'll be out at spring training from, uh, this, uh, the third, yeah, the 13th to March 26th. So, uh, anytime after that during the season, hit me uh, up and, and we'll get you over. Well, I, I keep telling Cade we're going to a major league game this year. And he's like, nice. only if it's the Yankees or the Padres. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, okay. okay, at least I know Eric with the Yankees. I'm not going to Petco Park, dude. He's like, no, Petco Park. <laughs> okay, man. We'll see what we can do. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Better get okay. the Reds on that list. Come on, Kay. No, I know. I know. I'm going to work on I'll it. I'll send you guys some gear. Yeah. The, the Reds are my my <laughs> childhood team, man. We we have the Indians oh, yeah? here. But yeah, yeah. No, they're my, my childhood team. So, okay, last but not least, number five. Yeah. What's next for Aaron Kunanen? Yeah, uh, like I mentioned, uh, getting ready for spring training. That's going to be a bear. And, you know, it's a, it's a crazy time of year. But uh, awesome to have everybody in the same place for a number of weeks to get ready for 2023. Um, but just continue to build on the great work that we were able to do last year uh, and, and start on some new projects and initiatives um, this year. So just continue to grow the sports science space and um, you know, develop things here at the Reds. So uh, it's, it's looking to be a, a really good year coming up. I love it, man. So yeah, spring training and uh, sore legs, 
right? That's what you <laughs> yes, have to look yeah. forward to. Yeah, <laughs> yep. got some, got some uh, a block of tens coming up calling my name. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, Aaron, man, so great to catch up with you, dude. Love talking and love seeing where you're at, man. It's been very cool to watch your professional evolution. So with that being said, where can my listeners find out more about you and everything that you have going on? I appreciate it, Mike. And thanks again. You know, you've definitely been an instrumental part of that, you know, professional journey that I've had. So uh, I want to definitely thank you there. Uh, but in terms of finding me, I'm most active on Twitter at Aaron J. Kunanen. And I say most active very loosely, but uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely. If you, if you want to connect with me, uh, that's the best spot. I love it, man. I'll make sure I get uh, the link in the show notes. And again, Aaron, thanks so much for your time, brother. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. All right, my friend, that does it for this week's episode with Aaron. Really hope you enjoyed it. Definitely some proud parent moments in there. It's hard to believe this guy was an intern for us all the way back in our iFast 1.0 space. So, I mean, we're looking at 2009, 2010, but to see the success he's had in his career, to watch this career trajectory really take off, and to see all the amazing things was very, very cool for me. And for you, I hope you enjoyed the episode and you got some things out of it. You know, talking about making sports science more people or more athlete centered, I think, frankly, is a discussion we need to be having more because sports science is exploding. We can collect and we can track more data points than ever before. But bringing that back to the end user, to the athletes and the coaches, is where we're really going to make the greatest strides, I think, in the next 10 to 15 years. So if you enjoyed this episode, I've got one small favor to ask. If you haven't already subscribed to this show, do it right now today. Wherever you consume podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, Spotify, the Amazon store, go there right now, click on the subscribe button so you know each and every week when a new episode drops. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back next week with our next episode. Take care.